All right. Good morning, Grace Point. How you doing? Good, good. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm also really excited to be serving as the lead planting pastor of Grace Point Church Northwest. So that's fun. Uh, just a heads up for you, if you live up in the Northwest area, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today. Uh, next weekend, no, February 11th, we are actually going to be meeting at Betsy Rhodes Elementary School at 10 a.m. for a preview gathering. So if you live up in that area, we want to invite you guys to join us. Also, I just want to admit real quick that I'm pretty fatigued. Honestly, the reason for that is for about 10 days, I'm going to be rolling solo at my home with my three kids. My wife took off this past week, flew back to Kentucky. Her sister had surgery to remove uh, some pretty painful cancerous tissue. Thankfully, by God's grace, they got all the cancer, which is awesome. But uh, my wife is back there, which means for the past three days, it's been me and my three munchkins. And this morning, I got up to make breakfast, and I am fully aware I have a stain right here. So if that distracts you, it's over, okay? I know it's there, all right? I'm fully aware. Anyway, let's get to work. My name is Travis, like I said, Matthew 28. If you got a Bible, open up. If this is your first time with us today, and you don't have a Bible on your way out, feel free to stop by Centerpoint. We have Bibles there in English and Spanish, and you can have one absolutely for free. In the meantime, you can follow along by the side screens, or you can download the Grace Point Vegas app. Uh, all the texts that we're going to be talking through today are on there. Today we're going to be continuing and concluding our series called A Life Worth Living. Over the last month, month and a half, we have talked about how we believe here at Grace Point Church that a life worth living is a life lived for Jesus. It is a life lived in community with other believers. It's a life lived on mission, telling other people about Jesus. And it's a life lived as leaders, taking ownership of our lives, growing spiritually, as well as leading inside and outside the church. But today, what I want to talk about is how you and I are called to live to plant. Now, as soon as I say that, I know that some of you in this room are a bit confused. Maybe you're like me, and when you think about planting, you think about trees, or you think about a garden, or maybe you think about the grass in your house that you cannot, or at your property, that you cannot grow. It seems like every single year, my association decides to send me these wonderful pictures of plants I did not grow, <laughs> called weeds, but the actual grass will not grow, and maybe it causes some stress. But when I talk about living the plant, I'm not talking about necessarily vegetation and things like that. Matter of fact, what I'm talking about is summarized clearly in our big idea for today. Check out the side screens. This is what we're talking about. See, at Grace Point, we live as Christians who strive to plant gospel-centered churches locally, regionally, and globally. What this means is that we believe that every Christian in this room is called to start new churches. Follow along as I read our value statement of this big idea. Listen to this. It says this. We live as Christians who joyfully obey Jesus' command to plant new churches. We recognize that no church has spontaneously appeared out of thin air, but as a result of faithful Christians throughout history seeking to obey the Great Commission. This means that every church in existence was at some point planted, thereby making every Christian a part of a church plant. Jesus has commanded us not just to make disciples, but to what? Baptize. Baptism symbolically expresses a person's union with Christ through faith, as well as their belonging to Jesus' body, the church. In light of this, we understand that every Christian indwelled by the Holy Spirit has been commissioned by Jesus to either join new church plants or generously send new church plants. There is no third option. We strive to do this through the Grace Point Church Collective, which Grace Point Church Northwest is the first church planted out of that collective. We do this regionally through Acts 29 West, just like Matt showed right up here. By the way, I know Eddie. When I was up in Salt Lake City, I had an opportunity to meet him. Please be praying for him. But we also do this through Acts 29 Europe, and we are part of church planting projects in both India and Turkey. Now, I know this is a big statement. I'm going to try to unpack it. I'm going to try to unpack it by showing how baptism leads to church planning. But then I want to show us through the book of Acts how this is practically lived out through average, everyday, ordinary Christians given extraordinary empower in the Holy Spirit. They do what? They plant new churches. But in order to do that, it's important for you to understand my story and why this is so important to me. You see, I grew up in a family that was religious, but they weren't Christian. And there's a huge difference between those two things. At a young age, I was taught that God's love wasn't free, but it was something that you had to earn. And the way in which you earn God's love is by doing a bunch of good things and a bunch of religious deeds. 
Well, I knew instinctively as a kid that I could not be good no matter how hard I tried. So I just gave up. And therefore, going to church was one of the most pointless things to me as long as I could remember. My dad would literally wake me up in the morning, force me to get ready, drag me off door frames, and throw me into the car to get me to go to church. But in middle school, late in middle school, this all changed. You see, God in his grace sent a kid into my life who would do exactly what we talked about doing a couple weeks ago, invest and invite. He would invest in my life. He would hang out with me. He would invite me to play basketball, do all these things with him. But then he would constantly invite me to hear the gospel, and he would constantly invite me to his church. And I can't tell you how many years I looked at this kid, and I said, no, I'm not going to, with you to church. But he was just relentless. Well, one day, he wised up and started playing to the passions of a middle school boy. He said, hey, Trav, you like to play ball, don't you, basketball? I said, yeah, sure, yeah, that sounds fun. He goes, you like to eat pizza, right? And I said, oh, yeah, I like to eat pizza. He said, well, on Friday nights, a bunch of youth get together at my church. They play basketball and they eat pizza. And I said, no, no, man, church is boring. I don't want anything to do with it. Like, I just don't want to go. He goes, well, uh, you know that girl you like? <laughs> yeah? She goes to church on, on Fridays. I said, well, you don't have to tell me twice. I'm there. <laughs> and so I started going, playing ball, eating pizza, started dating the girl. My dad took notice and he thought it was really strange. He would have to pry me off door frames, get me into the car, remember? Now I'm going to church on my own volition. And so he thought I had joined something strange, but instead of telling me not to go, my dad did something just completely just crazy. He decided to check it out for himself. He started to go on Sunday mornings, and guess who he brought with him? His family. And that first Sunday, as my dad sat in a room similar to this, and he heard Pastor Bob preach the gospel clearly. Because what did we talk about a couple weeks ago? Romans 10, 14. We've been praying that. Faith comes by hearing. God was gracious. Opened up my father's heart to the gospel. I can count on one hand how many times I've seen my dad cry. And that was once. Because it was the first time in his life he ever heard God loved him unconditionally. He didn't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. And it was glorious good news. And with that, Jesus saved my father. Then what did my dad do? He immediately started going after our family. He shared the gospel with my mom, got, that led my mom to Jesus. They both got baptized in the pond at this girl's house who by this time broke up with me because I wasn't a Christian. And I remember my dad got baptized, then he baptized my mom in the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I just remember clearly as a kid going, man, you can save me all you want, but I call the shots. I don't need a Lord. But my dad was relentless. Every single day, praying for me, sharing the gospel with me, my mom as well. And eventually, by God's grace, God opened my heart to receive the good news of what he has done. And then my dad ended up baptizing me. But later in high school, some of the pastors in my church pulled me aside. And they said, Travis, we noticed that there's some gifting in you, and we'd like you to potentially pray about becoming a pastor. And so I did. I started studying the Bible. I started reading 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to give me this passion, this unction, this desire for the pastoral ministry. And so I put my yes on the table. I had the word. I had the Holy Spirit. I had these elders speaking into my life. I decided to go into ministry. Well, they thought, hey, if Travis is going to be a pastor, then we need to help train him. So they invited me to this conference in Chicago, Illinois. It was a pastoral leadership conference. And during a break, while we were sitting there, I was with a bunch of my friends. We were just drinking coffee. Pastor Bob sits down at the table, and he begins to tell us the story of how he planted Northeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, I knew about planting. I'm from Kentucky. Every holiday, we would go to my grandparents' farm, but I had never in my life heard about church planting. See, like some of you in this room, I falsely assumed that churches just were. I never really took time to discover how they get here. But what you've got to understand is this, is that no church has spontaneously just appeared. You see, each and every person who calls himself a Christian more than likely came to faith in a church plant or through a ministry that was connected to a church plant. Think about it. The church in which you came to believe in Jesus is either really young or really old. It might have been started in 2007 or it might have been started in 1807. It doesn't matter. Regardless, that church didn't just spontaneously appear out of thin air. 
but rather it was planted by Christians who were being faithful to Jesus to do what? To plant churches. In the book of Acts, and we'll be there in just a bit, we see a rapid planting of churches going on. Tim Keller, who is just a Yoda smart Christian, I mean, he's just smart. Listen to what he says. To put it simply, the multiplication of churches is as natural in the book of Acts as the multiplication of individual converts. Why would Tim Keller say this? Why would these Christians in Acts go plant churches? The answer is really simple. It's the answer to every question in the church. And what is the answer to every question in the church? Jesus. Jesus. Look, look, look. I went in doubt. Jesus. Like, <laughs> yes, Jesus. Jesus commanded them to do what? To plant churches. Look at Matthew 28. Listen to what it says. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is known as the Great Commission, but if we're honest, many Christians know it as the Great Suggestion. We know this. We can recite it, but we do nothing with it. It's kind of like if I was to go up to my children one day and say, hey, kids, I want you to go back in the backyard, and I want you to pick up all the dog poop, which is one of their jobs. Now, what would happen if they came back in a few hours and said, hey, Dad, I remember what you said? How happy do you think I would be? Probably not happy at all. Why? They didn't do what I said. What if they came back a few hours later and said, hey, Dad, I remembered what you said, and this time I can quote it to you in Greek. I might be really impressed, like, wow, I didn't know you could speak Greek, but would I be happy? No. Why? They still haven't done what I said. Jesus is telling his disciples in this verse, in light of my authority, go. And these disciples have seen Jesus' authority, especially in this gospel, put on display in a masterful way. You see, in Matthew chapter 4, they saw that Jesus had authority over sickness and over demons. How? They saw Jesus heal people. And they saw demons literally flee at the presence of Jesus. You go to Matthew chapter 8, and they see that Jesus has authority over nature. Because what does Jesus do in Matthew chapter 8? He calms a storm. Literally, it can be translated, he puts the storm into time out. He's like, sit down, be quiet, and stay quiet. The past three days, I've been telling my kids over and over again, sit down, be quiet, stay quiet. And I have no other higher power called my wife around to call upon, right? <laughs> but Jesus didn't have to do that. You see, what these disciples knew in this text is that the only one who had the power to control the wind, the wave, the seas is God. And Jesus in that text doesn't go expelliarmus and put the storm in time out. He just says, be quiet, which means what? God's in the boat. God's in the boat. He's got authority. You look at Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus has authority over sin. How do we know this? He forgives sin. And then in Matthew chapter 28, we see that Jesus has authority over the ultimate enemy that you and I are going to face, and that is death. And what did Jesus do? Came back to life. You look in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says this, if you, or says this, follow me, and I will make you fish for men. I will make you fish for men. You see, from the beginning, Jesus says his followers would do what? Fish for men. And here at the conclusion of this book, he concludes by saying, all disciples will be what? Disciple makers. This means from beginning to end, to be a disciple of Jesus means to make more disciples of Jesus. We can't miss this. It's the big E on the eye chart. To be a follower of Jesus is to make more followers of Jesus. And so Jesus says, in light of this authority that I have put on display for you to see, go. And I would argue, if you want more of Jesus' presence in your life, then join the mission that Jesus is on. Why do I say this? Who did Jesus say he would be with? Those who are on his mission. And how long will he be with them? To the very end of the age. It is not uncommon for people to come up to me and say, hey, Travis, I'm feeling a little stagnant in my relationship with Jesus. I mean, I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm serving at grace point. What's going on? What do I need to do? I will often respond with this question. When is the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? And they just look at me so funny. Well, what's that have to do with anything? It has everything. Because who did Jesus say he's going to be with specifically? Those who are out making disciples, proclaiming his name, talking about him amongst all people. 
You see, the commission and promise of Jesus was given to every single believer in Jesus. No one who claims to follow Jesus gets a pass. There is no such thing, according to the Bible, as a Christian who is not on mission. A good friend of mine will oftentimes ask me, he'll just simply say this, Pastor, what are my orders? He asks me that a lot. Pastor, what are my orders? Jesus is saying, Christian, here are your orders. Make disciples. Make disciples. And what is awesome about this is that Jesus doesn't just tell us to make disciples. He tells us how to make disciples. What did he say to do in Matthew 28? To baptize and to teach. And what I would argue, by commanding us to go and baptize people, what Jesus is doing is he's commissioning us to start new churches. Why? Because baptism, along with communion, is one of the two ordinances Jesus has given to his church. What this means is that he has ordained it, he has commanded it, and it's supposed to be an ongoing practice in the life of the church. In the Bible, we see that baptism represents a few things. It has individual aspects, but it also has corporate aspects. You see, in the Bible, in Romans chapter 6, we see that baptism represents our trust. It's a symbol to represent our trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to be made right with God. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that as you and I are buried under water, what that is symbolic, symbolically identifying with is Jesus' death in the grave, which means that I'm trusting in his death, his death alone to make me right with God, nothing of my own doing. But not only that, I'm also saying that my life to sin is dead. That's what I'm saying. And so as you're under that water, all that symbolic action is going on. You see, it's our faith that unites us to Christ, but it's baptism that symbolizes, and this is key, symbolizes that union. It is not your baptism that saves you. When my dad baptized me in that same pond after the girl broke up with me, I remember he held me under for a long time. He thought it was hilarious. I came up out of the water almost swinging at him, like, what are you doing? He's like, I had to get it all out of you. <laughs> That's not, he was joking, but that's not what baptism means. Some of us in here are thinking, well, if I get baptized, then, then I'm good, right? No, because if you don't have faith in Jesus and you get baptized, honestly, it's just a really nasty bath. A lot of people coming in and out of there. Like, that's just, you know what I'm saying? It's not the water that saves you. It's Jesus and Christ alone that saves you. So as you're under that water, you're saying, I'm dead to sin I'm, I'm trusting in what Christ has done, but as you're, you come up out of that water, what are you saying? I trust in Jesus' resurrection. You see, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is an emphatic declaration that he has done everything in his life, death, and resurrection to do what? To bring you and me back to God without a scrap of our assistance. And so as we come up out of that water, we're saying, I'm trusting in that. But also what I'm saying is I am now alive to God by the Holy Spirit. You see, baptism is I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God through Christ and Christ alone. John Piper uses an analogy. I think this is beautiful. He says it like this. He says an analogy would be saying, with this ring, I thee wed. When we say that, we don't mean that the ring or the putting of the ring on the finger is what makes us married. No, no. It shows the covenant and symbolizes the covenant. But the covenant-making vows make the marriage. So it is with faith and baptism. So similarly, Paul is saying, what this with this baptism, you are united to Christ. Does that make sense? And that's got to be very, very clear. So there's an individual aspect to our baptism. But there's also a corporate aspect to our baptism. You see, baptism not only pictures that faith and that unification with Jesus, but it also shows us and symbolizes us belonging to Jesus' body, the church. Listen to what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with who? Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one what? Body. That's a church. Jews and Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. 
You see, baptism is used metaphorically here to refer to the Spirit's work within the believer to unite him or her to the body of Jesus, which is the body of believers. And one of the things I absolutely love about what we do here at Grace Point is oftentimes here in just a few weeks in Easter, you're going to see us perform baptism. We're going to get to experience that. And when that happens, people stand up here and whoever's in the tub, right, their story is read, telling the story how they came to know Jesus, how they're trusting in Jesus. And then they are baptized. And usually the person who is baptizing that person, what do they say? Grace Point Church, do you welcome such and such into the family of God? And what does Grace Point Church say? Yes. And then what do we start doing? We start clapping, cheering. We kind of throw a party, right? Why do we do that? It's because baptism symbolizes a person's faith in Christ, but it also symbolizes their connection to Jesus' body, and that is the church. You and I must understand and constantly beat into our heads that church is not something we go to. Church is something that we are. It's an identity given to us and a family that we belong to in Jesus. You see, there is no such thing as a Christian who is not also connected to a local church, who is connected to Jesus' body. It's an impossibility. It's a foreign concept in the Bible. So when you become a Christian, guess what? You are absolutely in right relationship with God, but now you have a relationship with a group of people. And let me tell you something. The family's really big. And I will tell you this. You don't get to pick and choose who comes into the family any more than you got to pick and choose which family you were born into. I didn't get to pick and choose my brothers, right? I think I would have picked maybe Michael Jordan or somebody like that. But I got Shad, right? But I love him to death. I didn't get to pick and choose that. In the same way, you don't get to pick and choose who Jesus saved. But you are called to love him. You see, practically what this means for you and me is that we are to be Christians who are living in community. Go back to that week that we believe a life worth living is a life lived in community. And it's your responsibility and it's my responsibility to be in community with other Christians. I hear people oftentimes say, I love Jesus, but I don't really like his church. One of the other images for the church in the Bible is called a bride. And if you came up to me and go, hey, Travis, I really like you, but your wife, whoo, I don't know about that one. How do you think I'm going to respond? Probably not too, too nicely. In the New Testament, we are told 59 times to do something with one another, to love one another, to serve one another, to bear up with one another's burdens. You can't practice the one another's without being with one another. Make sense? But we also believe that baptism commissions us to church planning. You see, since baptism symbolizes our unity with Jesus and his church, when Jesus gives us commission in Matthew 28, what is he telling his followers to do? Go plant more churches. And I would say this entire series, A Life Worth Living, all culminates into the planting of new churches. That we as a faith family, if we truly live for Jesus in all areas of our lives, if we truly live in community with one another, if we truly live on mission to proclaim and demonstrate Jesus to the community around us, and if we truly live as leaders, what it's going to do is to push us out to inevitably live to plant and to saturate this valley in churches that are all about Jesus. Why do I say that? Because that's what we see in the book of Acts. You see, the book of Acts tells us that Christians went out and started churches. Now, some of this is going to be a little redundant to two, two weeks ago. But how many of you have ever, in here have ever seen Sesame Street? How many times do we got to talk about the letter A, honestly? <laughs> honestly. Well, I think it's good for us to repeat things because we oftentimes repeat the things that are important. So look with me in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Listen to this. This is what Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The idea behind that statement, you will be, is in the indicative mood. It's an assertion. It's a statement of fact. Jesus is not saying you might be my witnesses. He's not even saying that you get a choice in being my witnesses. He says when the Holy Spirit comes into my, your life, you will be my witnesses. 
And what happens in this text is right after he says this, he ascends up to heaven. And what do the disciples do? They just stand there and look at him like a deer in the headlights, just looking, looking, looking. An angel comes down to him and says, what are you doing? And he essentially says, the way he went is the way he's going to come back. Now go get to work. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls on these people, falls on Jesus' disciples. Listen to what Steve Timmis says. He says, the Holy Spirit creates missionaries. As soon as he calls someone into the kingdom, as soon as he regenerates someone with life in Jesus, he has done what? Created a what? Say it. A missionary. And that's what happens. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit falls upon these followers of Jesus, these disciples. Peter stands up. He preaches the gospel. The Spirit convicts a whole bunch of people. But listen to what happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a big church. That's a big church. I hear uh, sometimes Christians say, I, I don't really like big churches. I'm just not for them. Just, just don't like them. And I can understand. I can sympathize with that. Most of the time when someone says that to me, they're saying, I want to be known. I want to know other people. And that's why community groups are so important. But I would argue, if you don't like big church, you might not be too fond of heaven. Because what does Revelation 7 say? That there's going to be a great multitude that no one can count standing before the throne of Jesus, worshiping the Lamb from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Right? It's a big, big church. Okay? But with baptism comes the planting of new churches. Listen to what Francis Chan and Tony Marita write. <laughs> it says this. Why plant churches? The Great Commission points to church planting. When Jesus told the disciples to baptize and teach all nations, these commands pointed to church planting. Baptism is about people identifying not only with Christ, but also with the body of Christ. In Acts 2, people are saved and baptized in the church forms, and they are also taught within the context of the church. With that, Christians go out and plant more churches in the book of Acts. And this planting wasn't the job of just a handful of specialists. No, these were everyday, ordinary people given extraordinary in the power in the Holy Spirit, being faithful to Jesus' command to do what? To plant churches. Look at Acts chapter 11. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But verse 20, this is significant. Look at this. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching what? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who are these people? They're ordinary people and dwelled with extraordinary power in the Holy Spirit. The text simply says that those who were scattered did what? They preached to the Jews, but they also preached to the Greeks. And what did they preach? The gospel. And how, how did these people go here? How'd they get here? Look at Acts chapter 8. Let's be reminded of some history. Check this out. This is why they were scattered. And Saul approved of his execution, that is Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for who? The apostles. And it says, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. You see, why did I say that churches were started not necessarily by the professionals, but by ordinary, average, everyday people given extraordinary power is because when this persecution happened, these people went all the way to Antioch. They went there and they preached the gospel. This chapter 8 here of Acts says that the persecution of Saul was so powerful, it uses the word ravage, that he was literally ravaging the church. Where, where do we get kind of an image of this? How many of you in here have seen Shark Week? Anybody seen Shark Week? Anybody willing to admit they binge watch Shark Week all week like me? Okay. But when that great white shark, you remember that one where he's just hammering down and just eating on that big dead carcass of a whale, just ravaging it? Like you stick a bone in a dog's mouth and what does that, bone, that dog do? He shakes it like that, right? That's the image that, that Luke is trying to say here. Paul was literally trying to rip the church apart from end to end to end. But no matter how much he tried to destroy the church, what did the church do? It goes on and it continues to start more churches. Paul in Acts chapter 9 ends up becoming a Christian. He gives up this name Saul, which is a big powerful king 
in the Old Testament, he takes the name Paul, which just simply means small. And it says in verse 26, what came of these guys going to Antioch? Listen to what it says. And when he, that's Barnabas, had found him, that's Saul, who was persecuting the church that Jesus had saved, listen to this, he brought him to Antioch, and for a, for a whole year, they met with the what? Who started that church? Paul? No, he wasn't there. Barnabas? No, he wasn't there. Average, everyday, ordinary Christians to being faithful to the Great Commission went to Antioch and started a church. This city, Antioch, is 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And guess who was one of the first missionaries sent out of this church? The Apostle Paul, and he didn't start it. You see, no matter how much he tried to stop the church, he couldn't. Eventually, Jesus saved him and sent him out of the very church he was trying to ravage. That is my God. And that is huge. What we see throughout this, these texts here is that Jesus has clearly called you and he's called me to do what? To plant more churches. This isn't something I am doing. This isn't something the elders here are doing. This is something we are doing as the Grace Point family that you and I are called to go start new churches. We're doing this with Jesus. And so just like we've done throughout this series, we just want to give you guys some practical handles of how you can join in the church planting efforts here at Grace Point. The first one is this, March 24th. You see, March 24th is going to be our Mission Vegas Day. And here's what we're going to do on March 24th. We're going to go out into the Northwest community. We're going to take 10,000 to 15,000 invite cards that point to coming to our Easter gathering on April 1st. And we're just going to distribute those throughout the entire community. Our entire mission Vegas for that day is to get 200 people in the Northwest just handing out cards, just to saturate the community in invitations, welcoming, welcoming them to Grace Point Northwest. Now, some of you in here go, well, does that really work? I won't make you raise your hand, but I imagine there are people who are in this room because they got an invite card that said religion is dead, a study in the book of Galatians. And I can tell you right now, when I started a church in Salt Lake City, we canvassed the area in invite cards. Three months after handing out that card, a couple came to our church going through a really bad way, and they said, you know what, I think we need to go back to church. Well, where do we go? And they had put it on their refrigerator. When we hand out these cards, who knows how God is going to use them to draw his people to his son so that they can experience the life and the hope in Jesus. So if you are willing to help us out on March 24th, you can write on that card that you got when you walked in today, I will hand out cards on March 24th. I promise you it'll be fun. We'll give you some water. And if you got kids, bring kids because those kids run up and down the streets so you don't have to right? Because that's what I did, and they were fast, man. They hit a street like that. I was like, man, you guys are fantastic. And most people aren't really upset when they see a kid go, hey, you want to come to church? Like they, <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? All right. <clears throat> Next one is this, number two. If you live in the Northwest, that means Centennial Hills, Providence, Sky Canyon, we're asking that you join this church in your community. Now, I want you to hear me say this. I love you all. I really do. Romans 10, 14, since we've been doing it, I've been praying for me and I've been praying for you. I love you guys. But some of the excuses I've heard for not joining the Northwest are fair, and some of them are frankly consumeristic. For instance, I've heard people say, well, the Ann Road Church, this church here is my family. Trust me, I get it. I get it. I feel the exact same way. When my wife and I accepted this call, to go start this new church. I'll be honest, for, for a while, we felt this little bit of sadness. Why is that? It wasn't that we were leaving, but what we were saying is, we're not gonna be able to see our friends as often. But the good news for us in the gospel that comforted our soul is this, that in the gospel, there are no goodbyes. There's just see you laters, or maybe I won't see you as often. Why do we say that? Because you and I have eternity together. 
Though I may be going 15 minutes up the road, that 15 minutes of the road is going to be spent in lifetime and eternity together. Listen to what J.W. Alexander says. He says this, Each instant of present labor is to be graciously repaid with a million ages of glory. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards says. He says this, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. <laughs> Why does he say that? Because the only way you and I are going to get through this life is if we have a long view. When we keep our heads down looking at the immediate, oftentimes what we do is we take what is right before us and we think that's all there is. And so we take a good thing, maybe a God-given thing, and we make it an ultimate thing and it becomes a God thing. And it, it competes for our worship. Yet when we keep our eyes on eternity, on what God has done to secure and assure our life for the rest of time, not only are we going to be with Jesus, but guess what? We're going to be with each other. And some of you are like, I really don't know if I want to be stuck with you, Travis. You don't get a choice. <laughs> it pushes us to get outside these walls to see what? More brothers and sisters come to know the good news of the gospel. So in the meantime, join the mission. Some of us in here have said, well, I'm a Thai guy, or I'm a Matt guy, or I'm a Tim guy. Or how about this one? I really love this Ann Road building. I mean, some of us know the pain of 10 years of portability. And when we get to finally walk into a facility and all the chairs are set up, we don't have to set them up. All the walls in the children's areas up, we don't have to do that. It becomes pretty comfortable, doesn't it? But let me tell you something. I get this one too. I'm also a Thai guy, a Matt guy, a Tim guy, a Nick guy. I mean, I love these buildings. My office is right there. I see them every day. But what I will tell you this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 1 and 3. Listen to what he says. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Verse 12, what I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Those are rhetorical. No, that's the answer, no. <laughs> Listen to what he says in chapter 3. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because we're going to be spending 32 weeks in 1 Corinthians as a church. And I want you to know, I praise God for the way he has used these men and these women and these facilities to make an impact in your life. But I'll tell you this. Who was crucified for those Corinthians? It wasn't Paul. It was who? Jesus. They weren't baptized into Paul, Cephas, Apollos. They were baptized into who? Jesus. Because at the end of the day, it's not about these buildings. It's not about these men. If you've heard us say anything from the stage, who is it always about? Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And I believe that each and every one of these people that I've just mentioned would be so grieved if the reason you didn't join what God was doing in the Northwest, if you live up there, you don't join what God is doing in the Northwest, is because they're here. You just heard it. They love you enough to do what? Just like we, we push our kids out of the home when they're old enough. They want you to go out and thrive in that community. Seeing your neighbors, your coworkers, your communities come to know Christ. So if you're willing to do that one, just write on the card, I am willing to join Grace Point Church Northwest. And then here's the third one. Some of us in here are saying, I'm not available on the 24th, I work. I don't live in the Northwest. What can I do? Here's what I'll say. It's probably the most important thing any of us can do. It's not probably it. It is. Just pray. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, what does he say? I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates are defensive, which means we're taking an offensive approach. When I was in soccer, I didn't play defense, okay? I drove my teammates nuts. But I'm like, Jesus says, don't play defense. Play offense. Charge the gates. And I'm like, I'm being like Jesus. There you go. Here's what I want you to see. Pray for us. Just like we said, mission ammunition is going to put holes into those gates. Guess what else puts holes into those gates? Your prayers. When you pray against the darkness in the city, I believe God is faithful to answer those prayers. 
and to push that back. And when we pray, what we are doing is we are honoring God because we're going to him, the only one who can truly do what Jesus said he would do, build his church. When my kids come up to me with their request, I don't look at them and go, why are you bothering me with that one? I'm usually honored by it. Why? Because they're coming to daddy because they know daddy can fix it. When the same way, when we pray, we're honoring daddy. We're honoring our father saying, God, you are the only one who can do this. So if you're willing to pray for Grace Point Church Northwest, just write on the card, I will pray for Grace Point Church Northwest. You can do this at 1014 a.m. every single day when you pray for us to get out in the community and share our faith. Pray for the Northwest Church. I'll finish with these two quotes. Listen to this. Peter Wagner writes this. He says, planting new churches is the most effective evangelistic methodology known under heaven. Steve Timmis wrote this, planting churches is God's mission strategy. People ask me, why are you so passionate about church planting? Here's the reason. One, who commanded it? Jesus. There you go. Church answer. You got it. Okay. Jesus. Number two, I agree with these men because I became a Christian at a church that Pastor Bob faithfully planted. And I would venture to say that most of you who call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ in this room, you became a Christian at a church somebody faithfully planted in obedience to Jesus. So let's live it. Let's get outside these walls and let's go plant more churches, Grace Point churches, throughout this entire valley. I got a goal in my head that I'd like to see by a certain date, but I'm not going to share it yet, okay? Because I got to talk to the other guys. <laughs> but I would love, by the time I go meet Jesus, that there are hundreds of churches in this valley making disciples of Jesus who live in community for the community. Let's pray.